Let's bow our heads for just a word of prayer, okay? Father in heaven, I pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit to be with us. Um, use these words, dear Lord, and just help us as we worship before you, that we might sense the, the Holy Spirit here to bless us. Help us, Lord, and help me in Jesus' name. Amen. In preparing for this uh, sermon, I decided to look up a definition of the word hypocrisy based on a mistaken idea. The Messiah came, but the people of Paul's day did not recognize him. They thought that by strict obedience to the law that they could establish their own righteousness. Now remember, I've told you before, haven't I, that you can earn your own way by, you can earn your own salvation by strict obedience to the law of God, do you remember? And I told you, of course, it's a trick statement, right? You understand that? So how do you do it? You do it by perfectly keeping the law of God and by having kept it perfectly always in the past. So how many think they can accomplish that? Yeah, see, that doesn't work. If you could do the first, you and I have already failed in the second. So Paul says in Romans 10 verse 4, he says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Question again, does that mean that we toss the law out because we have faith? Absolutely not. Romans 3.31, do we then make void the law through faith? What does he say? Certainly not. In other words, how can you think such a thing? On the contrary, we establish the law. Christ is the fulfillment of the law in that he is the perfect representation of how the law is to be kept. The law points to him and says, this is how it's to be done. Jesus kept his father's law perfectly, and by faith, we receive a righteousness that is not our own. We receive his righteousness, and the Holy Spirit, through that same faith that accepts Christ by faith, begins the work of writing the law in our hearts and our minds. And then Paul writes these words. He says, For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, the man who does these things shall live by them. So again, if you're going to save yourself by obedience to the law, you have to keep it perfectly and have always kept it perfectly, which is not possible. Which is why Paul says in verse 6, But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. In other words, who of us has the power to make Christ come down here and die for us? No one. We can't do that. We couldn't do it. Even if we did, who of us has the power to raise Christ back up from the grave? Again, none of us has that power. Interestingly enough, both things were provided for by the Father. He sent his Son to die for us and then called his Son out of the grave out of the tomb. And then Paul continues, verses 8 and on. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So he says, with the heart... One believes unto righteousness. What is it that we believe? What do we believe? We believe, first of all, that Christ is Lord and God. We believe that Christ, our Lord and our God, came to earth and died for our sins. We believe that by faith in him, our sins are forgiven. We believe that he was raised from the dead. And because he, because he lives, we believe that he offers to us eternal life and the promise of the resurrection. Faith is when we say, I know his promises are for me. His promises are for me. Faith says, I know that in Christ my sins are forgiven. Faith says, he will change and transform me by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. It is in the heart that a hunger for God is born. It is in, a, in the heart that a hunger to be with Jesus is born. You know, I've said it before, that I believe that God is looking for those who want him 
God is looking for a unique person who wants him in their life. You know, there are those who obey him just in case he might really be there. Just in case. They want to make sure that when he comes that they find themselves on his good side. But there are those who, after learning about the kind of God that they serve, they long to be in his presence. And maybe, I don't know, maybe somewhere in our Christian journey we transition from the one to the other. Sometimes we start out for small reasons. You know, the gold mansions, the golden streets, um, all of the things that are promised. And then there comes that point where we journey into the country of suddenly beginning to discover how much we love Christ and, and how, how wonderful it must be to be in his presence. And we begin to long for that and we transition from one perspective to the other. The more we learn, the more we come to love him and the more we desire his company and his companionship. All of these things happen in the heart. They happen where no one but you and God can see them. Isn't that interesting? They happen where only you and God can see them. Only you or God know whether these things are happening for you or not. Now, we are promised that if we pray, he will hear. We are promised that if we repent, he will forgive. We are promised that if we surrender, he will adopt us as his children. So do you believe these promises? These promises are for you and me. You know, one of the first verses I ever memorized as a young Christian comes from Jeremiah 31, verse 3. Jeremiah 31, verse 3 says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. It's the picture of the Heavenly Father wanting to draw us into his arms, to hold us, to pull us into his arms and just hug us and hold us. The longing of the Heavenly Father to hold his children and let them know how much he loves them. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. These are just two of the many Bible verses that repeatedly tell us of the everlasting love of God for us. I'm getting so excited. I'm throwing things around up here. Amen. Yeah, it's backwards now. Do you understand that it is not faith or humility when we stand wringing our hands Lamenting, oh, I don't know how he could possibly love someone like me. Brothers and sisters, that's not humility. It's not faith. It's unbelief. And you have to remember that it was unbelief that kept Israel from entering the promised land. As impossible as it might seem, as improbable as you might think it is, you are loved with a love so deep and so intense that Christ would have come to save just you, if you were the only one who had fallen. Faith accepts that message. Faith believes that message. Faith reaches up with trembling hands to take the offered gift. Faith dares to believe, sometimes perhaps with quaking heart, that the promises are real for us. It's real for you, and it's real for me. God loves you so much. He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows everything there is about, to, about you. Romans 10 verse 10 says, um, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When these words were first written, when Paul wrote these words in Romans 10.10, 10, it says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When Paul was writing these first words, persecution was very real and very deadly. There were those, there were some who thought that as long as they believed in their head and, and confessed everything in their head that they were okay, that everything would be okay. But faith, in order to be real, has to be expressed. It has to be expressed some fashion. And to express one's faith in Paul's time meant finding themselves in the gladiator's ring or being, being impaled on a stake and burned in the arenas. Openly confessing your faith in Jesus meant rejection by your family or perhaps the loss of everything that you owned. 
But you know something? The devil has done a complete turnaround for us. Because of the lack of persecution now in our culture, he has made it possible for us to give confession to faith in Christ and to not really have it in the heart. He has succeeded in making hypocrisy fashionable. The greatest damage that has been done to Christianity is to make us say one thing and do another. To put on the show and when no one is looking, do the opposite. For us, living in this a day and age, our confession has to be not just with words, but with the way we live. You know by now, I hope, that nothing is a secret anymore. The website you visit, the things you watch, the messages that you send either by text or email are not a secret. Where you are can be figured out because your cell phone is always pinging the signal to the towers in the area, so it's easy to track where you are. And I was telling Bill earlier something quite interesting, and that is, I, you know, I have sleep apnea. Um, that started a long time ago. I remember I had a procedure. They did an endoscopy and sedated me pretty heavily. And, and um, during the recovery, I woke up three times with a recovery room nurse standing over me, shaking me violently by the shoulder, screaming, breathe, breathe. <laughs> because apparently every time she turned around, I would just simply stop breathing, you know. And uh, so when I got out of the recovery area and got out to where Sandy was, I, I, I told her, uh, what was happening or what had happened and she said oh um, she said you do that in your sleep all the time and I thought well I knew I snored I've snored since I was a since I was a kid I mean like, like I say the dean at Union Springs Academy Jack Menges he always knew when I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing because he couldn't hear me snoring over the monitoring system in the dorm you know because <laughs> I snored like a train you know even when I was a teenager you know so I have a sleep machine right you know and uh, if I'm not careful, I stop breathing. And so um, the doctors, you know, got to talking to me about my machine. It was 12 years old, and they said, time for a new machine, <laughs> you know. And uh, so I had to go over and do a sleep study, which is kind of uh, an irony in term, because, you know, they put me in a strange bed um, and starch sheets and uh, with stuff stuck all over me. And the last thing I'm going to do in that setting is sleep. <laughs> But anyhow, they had me go through another sleep study and announced that I need a new machine, you know. So I get my new machine. And about uh, two weeks later, and in actuality, about two weeks later, I get a message that says, Congratulations, you've used your CPAP for more than four hours a day for the last nine days. And I'm thinking, how do they know that? <laughs> I mean... And, and what's funny was that um, I got it again this morning. It actually sent the message. Great job. You've used your device for more than four hours a night for over seven consecutive nights. We hope that you're adjusting well to your therapy. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out, how do they know that? My machine is talking to people. You know, it's, it's communicating. It's sending messages. And I haven't got a clue how it's doing it. Nothing is really a secret anymore. It really isn't. Nothing is a secret, brothers and sisters. Which means that if there was ever a time to live above board, it's now. It's now. If there was ever a time to live for Christ, it's now. And we are running out of time to figure it out. Our testimony for Christ is no longer just the words that we say. Our testimony for Christ is how we live. And what we do, what we think, even when no one is looking. Now, no one is perfect. That is the reason why the grace of God is still as important to us as ever. God's mercy and forgiveness is as real for us now as it was when we first came to Christ. But it's all about the heart and the life. It's what we believe and how we live. And it will take the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to change both of those. How we believe and how we live. And it's not too late. 
Time, I believe, is running short, but probation has not yet closed. The coming of Jesus is nearer than ever before, but there is still time to understand what it means to walk with Jesus. But there is no time for delay. There is no time for delay. Second Chronicles 7.14 I don't know whether it's on there or not, but Second Chronicles 7.14 is a passage you know well. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humbly humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. There is only one thing that God wants from us. I don't have enough gold to satisfy him. I don't own enough property to please him. My cars aren't expensive by any stretch, but even if I had an expensive car, it would mean nothing to him. The only thing that God wants from us is our hearts. He knows that if he wins our heart, if he wins our love, he gets everything. So he speaks softly to us of his great love. He speaks softly into our ear of his great mercy and forgiveness. He washes away our guilt and our despair. And through the indwelling Holy Spirit, he writes his laws in our heart and mind. He transforms us and makes us into lights for his kingdom. You are not beyond his reach. If you've fallen, you haven't fallen so badly that his grace cannot help you. At the very moment, you know, when I was working on this sermon, I'm, uh, I'm on my computer typing, and, uh, and the corner of my computer, a message popped up because I have a live news feed that will feed stuff. You know, I don't really like the news much these days, so I'm kind of tending to want to turn it off. But it popped up on the side of the screen with a news clip from a newspaper called The Hill. And it says this, just this little square, U.S. life expectancy falls driven by suicides and drug overdoses. First time that U.S. life expectancy reversed direction and fell because of suicides and drug overdoses. You see, people in our world are being overcome by despair and by hopelessness and loneliness. In a world where communication seems to be as easy is picking up my cell phone and texting. When communication <clears throat> seems as easy as sending an email to people, you know, sending, and I've got four different emails, three different emails, and, and Facebook Messenger got forced on me. I realized that people were sending me things through Facebook Messenger, and so in spite of the fact that I didn't want a fourth email, I now have to go look at that thing to make sure I'm not missing something from people sending me messages. In a world where communication seems to be everywhere and as easy as picking up our little cell phones, we are in a world that is just being overwhelmed by loneliness. Isn't it funny at a point in which communication is so simple that people are being overwhelmed by the sense of loneliness? But Christ, you see, has the answer. Christ loves us. He has a place prepared for you. We are told with your name on it. There are homes in the New Jerusalem waiting for us. And all you have to do is to accept the offer of grace and forgiveness and go claim what Christ has prepared for you. You don't have to be alone. Christ is your companion. His angels are your attendants. His Holy Spirit is working to write God's law in your heart and your mind. Jesus is coming soon. He's going to take us home. But it begins for us with believing that God's blessings and promises are ours for the taking. It doesn't matter what mistakes have been made in your life. It really doesn't because God's promises are for you too. His grace and his mercy is for you too. All of the promises of the Bible are yours. 
to claim just by reaching out the hand of faith and taking them. Your sins have been forgiven. The Holy Spirit is working to write the law of God in your heart and your mind. He will change you. And there is a, pra- a place prepared for you in the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Does it sound like something you're interested in? Are you interested in getting it? Let me see your hands. All you have to do is just is take the promises. They're yours. They're yours. They're for you. You don't have to leave feeling like it's for everybody else but you, but it's for you. His promises have been made for your sake. They're yours for the taking. Father, I bring this church family to you. And I know that in every heart there have been those moments of loneliness and despair and discouragement. Despair and discouragement over our failures and our mistakes. And and wondering whether the blessings and the promises that have been made are for us or for, uh, for someone else. But dear God, I pray that you will fill each heart here with a sense of confidence and peace that your promises are theirs as well. That we know that the promises have been made for us. Remove the loneliness, dear Lord. Fill their heart with a sense of your presence and your blessing. Fill their hearts with courage and faith. Give them the ability to hang on to the promises you've given and to trust. We give ourselves to you, Lord, and we ask through the working of your Holy Spirit that not only will faith be real in our hearts, but that we will live it out day by day in obedience to you, not as a means of saving ourselves, but because we want to live as a testimony of our love for Jesus and for you. Bless us and help us. Keep these people close to you, dear Lord. Give them a sense of your presence and your blessing. Give, fill their hearts with confidence and hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.